Hi, listeners. Garth here. Before we begin today's episode, I wanted to grab your attention off the top, as I think this might be one of the most important episodes we've ever recorded. And while we've sat down with many impressive psychologists and told many important stories related to students and teaching, or as we discussed content and skills and institutions and cultures and, and so many other things, I just want to let you know that there's something a little different about what you're going to hear today. Of course, um, Eric and I and our guests, we dabble in vulnerability in our conversations, and that's the uh, end stuff of uh, psych sessions. Uh, but of course, we also don't shy away from having real, honest conversations. It's just that they don't generally take center stage in the episode. So this one's a little different. Missy Beers is more than a national leader and colleague. Uh, she's a dear friend to many of us in the teaching of psychology world. For goodness sake, uh, she and I went to Hamilton together in Chicago uh, a couple of years ago. So there's nothing really that cements a friendship like that experience. And as you'll hear shortly, uh, Missy and Eric have a unique relationship themselves. It's really just not difficult to be friends with Melissa Beers. Let me tell you. And it's out of that friendship that the two of them have this conversation. Uh, in short, over the last couple of years, uh, Missy has been to hell and back. And she has learned some really important things. And she wanted to share some of those things with you and me. I've been thinking recently about why we listen to people, whether uh, authority figures or mentors or people on social media, like what qualifies a person to be able to speak to you? Uh, first, I think we can agree that uh, any person worth listening to must have some authority on a topic, obviously. I'm realizing these days that authority isn't enough for me. There are many people who are experts on a topic that I do not feel compelled to listen to. They don't speak to me. In addition to being an authority, I think I need someone who can tell me something about being human, about sitting where I'm sitting, about going places I have gone or places I will go. And about my fears, my challenges, and my needs. And in short, they need empathy. For those reasons, Missy is qualified to speak to me, and I think to you as well. And even though this story comes out of Missy's personal life, it has everything to do with students. And Missy makes that connection clear as they discuss it, uh, because Missy loves people. And she loves her job, and she loves students. As you listen to this conversation, I think you'll agree with me that you are hearing a transformed person, someone who has been to some other place, who has fought and conquered, and who has returned back to tell us about it, but not without wounds. Missy, uh, you are brave and so resilient, and you are an inspiration to me, and I really appreciate you sitting down with Eric and sharing uh, this wisdom with us. And so, uh, that's what I have to say at the top of this episode. Um, I hope that you will stick around and listen. Um, but first, let me just take a couple of minutes to uh, give our typical introduction for the Psych Sessions podcast um, to tell you about our sponsors, and then I will get you right to the conversation. Thanks. Hello, 
and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 131, where Eric had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Melissa Beers from The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. But before we get to that, a word from our sponsors. Are you looking for more affordable quality materials for your intro psych students? Check out Hawks Learning's mastery-based courseware and texts. These materials introduce foundational psychology and research concepts that inspire students of all majors to think more critically about the world around them. Students and instructors benefit from built-in support features like error-specific feedback, explanatory videos, and detailed progress reports. Explore Hawks Learning's mastery-based intro psych materials, available to students for as low as $43, and free chapter projects and example videos exclusively for Psych Sessions listeners at www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Again, that's www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Right here on Psych Sessions, we are introducing Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology, setting a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. Coming in 2022, Achieve brings together everything instructors and students love about their digital course content, including interactive eBooks, learning curve, adaptive quizzing, additional assessments, immersive learning activities, extensive instructor resources, and more, all in a powerful yet easy to use new platform. And we'd like you to have an exclusive first look and tell us what you think. Go to macmillanlearning.com backslash psych sessions to sign up for a preview activity. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. And now, here is Dr. Melissa Beers with Eric Landrum. I am here with Dr. Melissa Beers from The Ohio State University. Hi, Missy. Hi, Eric, my friend. Good it, to see you. It is so delightful to talk with you. You've been on the uh, podcast before. I didn't bother to look it up. It's been years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I believe, was- it, and I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but I, Garth interviewed you, right? It he wasn't did. me. Was he it? did. In uh, We were in um, Washington, D.C. for an intro psych initiative meeting. And so I think it was the first meeting. So that would have been like December of 2017 or something like that. Okay. So for like an IPI thing. Correct. And he pulled you aside and interviewed you. Well, I'm, no. I'm glad that one's on the books and people can clearly go back and listen to that. This one's going to be a little bit different. And the and so a lot of our listeners who, who are Psych Sessions regulars, uh, they know you, Missy, and we all love you. Thank you. And so they know much of your backstory, but some of your recent backstory. Right. But some don't. And so some listeners are going to go, Eric, what are you doing? How, <laughs> how could you do this? But please know that Missy's agreed to this. And I, I asked to talk to you about it. So okay. Thank that, you that's very sweet me. of you to be so blunt about that. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, people are going to think, which wouldn't be that far out of the ballpark, that what a tremendous ogre that guy is. Never. To Never. Have, to have Missy on and have her talk about such things. But... To give the context of, I think, a conversation that we're going to have about compassion and change and empathy in a person's life, right. the details and context of, I know I'm going to get to it, I promise. But something happened in your life around December 23rd, 2019, mm-hmm. that changed your life and your son's life forever. Yes. And the reason I know that date is because I know you. 
And I was also on Instagram and Twitter at the time and probably saw it on Facebook, perhaps. And it's your story to tell. So Missy, Mm -hmm. share with our listening audience what you're comfortable sharing, my friend. No, I'm happy to share this story. And I really want to talk about what came next. Because I I think that's really important for us all now as we're kind of coming back from the pandemic. But I want to pull back just a little bit to 2019 because 2019 as a whole was just a phenomenal year. It was one of the best years of my life professionally, that's for sure. I was doing a lot of presenting. I think I traveled to present once a month at least. I spent a week in Washington, D.C. with APA. I spent a week in New Orleans at at Xavier with Elizabeth Hammer. I spent a week in Warsaw, Poland at the University of Warsaw doing faculty development with Beth Morling. I was doing my job and I think I wrote like three chapters (laughs) that year and worked on an art. I mean, it was just an insane, I was just going and going and going and loving it and just taking more on and going. And, you know, I've always been sort of a person who just likes to do a lot of things. I like to stay busy. I like challenges. I'm like, I'm always like, I'll figure out how to do that because I want to. I'm really hardly ever said no to anything. And I had been rushing through the end of the semester, trying to get to the end of the semester. And we were moving into Christmas and I was in all Christmas readiness mode and getting all the shopping done. And we were putting our tree, we put our tree up on Sunday night and finished one of our trees. And I was planning to get up and go shopping the next day. And my husband was sleeping in, (laughs) I thought. And I knew he had to go to work that day. But as it turns out, he wasn't sleeping in. He had passed away. And there is a shock that hits you when something like that happens, the unimaginable happens in your life that I still struggle to describe. I really do. But what I will say, is in the aftermath of something like that, when nothing seems real, you just try to do anything that seems normal, right? Like the things that, so I tried to just keep going as normal, as my normal self at my normal speed. So, so Missy, let me give you a chance to take a breath. And so you're going along prepping for like a regular Christmas, regular holidays, getting the house decorated. Yeah getting Christmas presents wrapped. Had Randy been sick? Had he been to the doctor? I mean, and again, this may be none of my business. I mean, because sometimes we have loved ones in our life who are battling cancer or leukemia. And, and we know, we know the end result of Alzheimer's disease. We know the end result of many cancer cases, but that, that, that is not the situation with your late husband. That's right. It came out of the blue. There was no warning. There was no, I mean, afterwards we found out that there were some issues that he, that we didn't know about, but no warning was just went to bed one night and the next day he wasn't there. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That, that, I, I, I literally cannot imagine that we all watch movies, we see see TV shows and you see that depicted fictionally on law and order type things on TV where there's an investigation and a, a coroner and we watch things like that for entertainment, but I just can't imagine the real life. Well, I bet you can imagine horror. What's that? I bet you can imagine it, and it's as bad as you think. <laughs> you just, I, I, I bet you. I bet you could, I, and oh, yeah, it maybe, is maybe so. every bit as bad as you would think it is, yeah. and probably worse. Yeah, it's just like your life grinds to a halt. Everything you thought you knew about your life is almost completely gone. You're in a complete tailspin. You can't really can't focus. You're trying, you're trying to do things. Like I said, you're trying to push through. You're like two days ago, I was doing these things. I need to do them again, but you just can't. The shock and the grief overwhelms you so completely. And you really don't understand how you can't see from the inside, how that is impacting you. 
I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense, but you're just trying to be yourself and that grief just is on you like a, like a heavy blanket all the time. But the first thing I tried to do, the, the way I describe it is you try to just like muster all your resources and kick into high gear, right? And it's almost like when a car goes off a cliff, you see in the movies, like the car goes off the cliff and you're pushing forward and then all of a sudden there's nothing underneath you. Right. And you just can't. And I remember one day before the funeral, I had been going through pictures for the funeral for a couple of hours and it was so hard and so emotionally draining and something I really wanted to do for my husband. We'd been together 30 years. So it was a big task to go find all these pictures from moments in our life. But I felt like I owed it to him to, to do that. I wanted that for him and I loved him so much. And I remember sitting at the kitchen table still in my bathrobe, trying on my laptop to get these pictures. And I had gotten to the end, I like made a folder and I couldn't remember how to copy that folder onto a flash drive. I was just sitting at the laptop, looking at the laptop, trying to remember how to copy a file. Yeah. And my neighbor came to the door and I just said, come in. And he said, are you okay? And I obviously wasn't. And so he sat next to me and he like really patiently helped me copy the file. And then he said, I'm going to go get you something to eat. And he went and got Ben and me something to eat. And I, that really stays with me because having been at the level of functioning that I was just a few days prior to that, and then sitting there thinking, I don't even know how to do the simplest thing right now. I was like that for a long time. Well, and it's probably more complicated than that. And I don't want to talk you out of your beliefs or overanalyze it, but at some level you knew how to do it, but there was so, just so much cognitive and emotional exactly. load. Exactly. That, it overwhelms your mind. It overwhelms yeah. your emotion. Things just seem to shut down. There was just so um, much, I don't know what to call it, executive functioning going on. Correct. You're just yeah. so overwhelmed that you just, your brain just couldn't navigate to that command right. to, to know what to do. I mean, you still clearly knew how to do it. It's just the overwhelming sense of what you were processing. Right. It's d- um, the, disa- the disabling. Yeah. The feeling of just all these things things that you used to be able to do, you just can't. And you, you don't, in the moment, you don't really understand why. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I would imagine you're just trying to breathe and survive to the next moment. And that is is probably the most important thing. I don't think, I don't think someone who hasn't lived through what you have lived through can relate. The closest thing so I'm not going to say I, I know what it feels like or I know what you went through because I think that would be rude and disingenuous. The closest thing in listening to you, I, I think if a person has lost a grandparent or a parent or a brother or a sister, it starts to approximate that feeling. I don't think it's the same thing as a spouse. Certainly not the same thing as a spouse who you lived with and loved with for 30 years. Um, right, but I have also learned that there's no way to compare people's grief because everyone experiences grief differently. No. And so this is something really valuable that I have learned is that there's no way for someone to say, well, that doesn't seem like it should be as hard because you just, because it's, it just depends on the person and their experience, right? So, but I want, I'll get to that more later because yes, I have some thoughts about that. But I, everyone, I experienced very significant grief and trauma other people do too. And I just wanted to share this experience because what I've learned from going through that and coming back from that is the value of compassion. And I did not, I've always thought of myself as a compassionate person, Eric. I really have always thought of myself that way, but I'm going to be honest with you. I did not know what compassion was until I needed it. Because when you need it, you need so much more than you ever believed. I, 
yeah, I mean, that state of just being underwater. You feel, I felt underwater. And I felt like I was in slow motion, but the world around me was going at a breakneck speed. And I was constantly asking people to slow down what they were saying or repeat what they were saying because they were talking at a normal speed and I couldn't understand. Was it hard to ask for that compassion? Well, yes, it was because immediately people start saying, let me know what we can, let me know what we can do for you. Let us know what you can do for you. And I hadn't, I couldn't begin to articulate what I needed. I didn't know what I needed. I just, I was just, like I said, underwater in the dark. And some of my friends really pushed through that. One of my friends said, let's set up a meal train for you. And I said, I don't know. I just can't think about it. She's like, I'm just going to do it. Just tell me what you don't like to eat. (laughs) And she did. And then I realized, oh my God, I really needed it because then these meals started coming and we wouldn't have eaten, honestly, if that hadn't happened. Because you, you, I also lost track of the time. I would just sit down and a day would pass and suddenly it would be nine o'clock at night and I didn't know where the day went. I just really, and I was in therapy. I knew the minute that I talked to my therapist and she spoke very slowly and very deliberately and repeated herself that she understood what I needed at that moment. And so I thought, yeah, actually another friend of mine helped me find her. And so I got into therapy almost immediately and thank God that I did. And I still see her and she helps me just put things in perspective because sometimes I still lose sight of how that has affected me. It still affects me to this day. But You know, the people who just show up, (laughs) they just showed up, they just clean the kitchen or they just take care of things. All those close friends of mine that did those things, I didn't know what to ask for. Those are the ones who just sit with you and they're just there with you. So, so Missy, I I have a couple of things I want to ask you about. The classic thing I think that we say to people going through something like that is, please let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Right. Do you have some insight now on what a friend either nearby or far away, what a better, what's a better thing to say or not, is it not let me know what I can do for you or I'm going to do something for you. You should tell me, or I'm just going to guess. I mean, what, you know what I'm saying? I would say everyone's experience with this is going to be different. Yeah. But my experience was that I didn't know what to ask for. I couldn't really think what to ask for. And there's a little bit of pride almost or shame. I don't know what it was that I should be able to take care of things. I should be able to figure it out. So it was hard That was hard. A lot of people I know asked and would have helped, but I didn't know what to ask. So yeah, sometimes just trying, just showing up and offering, seeing something that needs to be done and offering. I think people who are local to someone going through this Mm -hmm. have, have to an extent somewhat of an advantage. And I don't know the background of how it got organized, but what Jane Hallina did with the GoFundMe. That was awesome. Something that was, that was mm-hmm. done at a distance, but something that look, looks like it was incredible. And that was just a godsend because I had to have cataract surgery just a couple of weeks after I'd been putting it off. But then I had to go and have the surgery. And thank God for that GoFundMe because it paid for the, the lenses. So, so just the compassion that I received, certainly from my workplace, because they said, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. We're just going to leave you to just take care of yourself and all of the class. Don't worry about your classes. Don't worry. We're just going to take care of all of that. And they did. And I was almost six months out. And I'm glad that I was able, thank God I was able to do that because I really wasn't functioning for the first four and a half months. Right. Um, barely functioning. And, and I would maybe get one thing done a day, like a critical thing, like, like a life thing one day at a time, I could get one thing done. And I just remember so many people would 
check in. I mean, I mean, so many people, all of my teaching people from everywhere that I love and love me. And I, they all, so many people reached out to me and, oh, the cards that came, I couldn't even read all the cards that came at first. I've never seen so many cards and notes and just messages of love and support. And that was amazing because then you just don't feel so much, you just don't feel so alone. You don't necessarily need people to do anything other than just say they care about you sometimes. But I, I remember saying to people, I just feel so far away from myself was the only way that I could describe it. I just felt so far away from myself. And I just didn't know how I was going to get back to where I had been. And that was terrifying because the person who would have helped me with that was gone. (laughs) And I just didn't know. I didn't know feeling as I did. I didn't know if I would ever regain that um, level of performance, competency, that the, the things that I felt that I just didn't have anymore. And that was hard. That was one of the hardest things that I just didn't feel that I knew who I was at that time. Now, obviously things have gotten better. We did roll into the pandemic right after that. So that was more isolating and more challenging for me, I think, but everybody suffered in some way with the pandemic. Rolled from there. I did teach in the summer. I had to figure out how to move my graduate teaching class online in about two weeks. I had a lot of I had a lot of support for that. And then I had to figure out how to, we didn't even know what modality the students would be teaching in the fall. So we had to figure out, not only help them learn how to teach, but try to figure out, we didn't know until halfway through the class, whether they would be teaching in person or online. So it was really just stumbling through. I was just stumbling through all of these things, just doing the best that I could. And I talked to my therapist a lot about my feelings about this. And she, her advice to me, was sometimes you just have to lower the bar and extend the timeline. Now to a person like me, if you had said that to me in 2019, I would have been like, no way. There's no, I don't need to lower it. I don't need either of those things. You you just dig down deeper and you push right through. And when you can't, you need to lower the bar and extend the timeline. And that really just became sort of a guiding philosophy for me through the whole pandemic, right? Like we, I think I related to people during the pandemic because I had just been going through this myself and I like, we don't have to push ourselves. All those messages that I kept getting from therapy and from listening to Tara Brock and from talking to people and just, just thinking we don't, why do we have to push through? Why do we have to push ourselves to these high, to these same standards, these expectations? What are those expectations? Where, where do they even come from? Right. Most of the time they come from, they came from me. And well, so well, I went see, into the it, pandemic. It, I think a lot of us did just trying to be as gentle as possible to ourselves and to our students, making decisions that were as gentle as possible. That was my approach. It's so interesting how the advice that we can give to people around us is not the advice that we would take ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because if this tragic event had happened to me, I think in a heartbeat, you would tell me, hey, Eric, lower the bar and extend the timeline. And you would tell me in a millisecond to extend grace and kindness to myself. Yep. But yet it was hard for you. It was hard to give that advice to yourself. It was hard. Yeah. We do this all the time. I think about what would I tell my son or what would I tell my daughter? Well, why wouldn't I give that good grace and kindness to myself or my wife or a good friend, you know, or a colleague? Correct. And so I still work on that. (laughs) I I do too. Uh, Yeah, I'm working on that still. But, you know, I really think that the thing that struck me is how much I needed, how much grace I needed, not just for myself, but for other people. 
and how much I really wanted to keep going, but I just couldn't. And how much I thought I how much I thought I should be able to do versus how much I really was able to do because the limitations that I was dealing with. And so that has, that just stays with me because as a teacher, when we often encounter students who are going through things, and I've met many students over the years that have had absolutely horrific things happen to them while they were in the middle of a semester. And I think now God, none of the accommodations that I tried to provide them were probably anywhere near what they actually needed. Because we don't have a mechanism for students, right? Like, what do we give them? An extension? An incomplete? That's not nearly, it's not, that cannot be nearly enough for some people with the things that they go through. And it just strikes me that we just don't really have much in the way of structures to support teachers when they go, what are the support structures for teachers in the middle of a semester when something happens? Or what are the support structures for students? We have lots of campus supports, but it's all just get going to the end of the semester, right? Keep it going and finish the class, or I guess withdraw as an option. But it's just, those are both, they're challenging in their own ways. And I just feel like, I don't know, but there should be something more or something else or something different just to acknowledge that life is disrupted and we can't always muster what we need to just finish. There are a lot of, I I agree completely. There are a lot of penalty structures. Yes. Penalty structures. For when many penalties, when things happen in a student's life, even I had an email from a student in my department chair capacity about she was trying to finish an incomplete And so she was really thankful that an instructor a semester ago issued an incomplete, but she was realizing the double-edged sword of that. She now has 15 credits this semester plus a three-credit incomplete to finish by a certain date. Otherwise, it turns into an F. So the instructor kind of delayed the inevitable by letting this student have an incomplete. So, So she dodged an F in a class. So that was good in the short term. For the moment, but but that could hurt her even further in the long term. It it very well could. And then if the student drops, then the issue becomes, is that going to be a financial aid burden? Because if you go under Mm -hmm. the minimum for financial aid, then you got to do a payback. And students have tragedies in the middle of a semester. Parents die, grandparents die, car accidents. I mean... And you can't compare from student to student how they ought to be reacting, right? right. Like we, this is the other thing. Like we really don't know what a student might need. And the student might know, might not know what they act, right? Yeah. Students might have, like, just, I, I had no idea what to tell people when they asked what I needed. I couldn't even think what I needed. I had no idea. I'd never been in this situation before. I didn't know what was going to happen the next day. I, how could I possibly ask for help? So I think we oftentimes ask students, well, how much time do you need or what do you need? They, they may not be in a position to understand what they need. And so I just think we all need to be understanding and compassionate and just recognize that there are limits to our understanding of what people may need. And we can't presume or compare what one student may need to yeah. another. And Missy, I also think this is partly part of where a faculty member is in her or his career and also their personal experiences. Because I think some faculty members are afraid of having the wool pulled over their eyes or being taken advantage of. So oh. I, I know faculty oh. members who, if you want an excused absence, I'm going to need to see the death certificate from the funeral or the, the death announcement from the funeral. Okay. Well, let me say something about that. Yeah. Because every time I have to look at my husband's death certificate, it knocks me down about two days. Yeah. Like completely. Just looking at it. And And so if somebody asks me to produce it, there's consequence, right? It's not, it is not just another form. Death certificates are not just another form. When I get something and it asks me for his date of death, I don't just write the death. It takes me right back to everything that happened that day. And I just think we can't just treat some things as if they're just procedural. We can't just treat, that's just not, you know, that's dehumanizing. This is the thing that goes along with compassion is there's so much dehumanization that I've now seen and now I recognize in teaching. We just expect students to 
just do it or too bad. That's dehumanizing. It's not really acknowledging what individual, I mean, good Lord, psychology, we're a discipline that is all about individual differences. If you're a psychologist, you're probably teaching about individual differences. But when it comes to understanding what students might need, if they have some kind of disruptive or traumatic event or what accommodation do we make for those individual differences? Yeah, I, a long time ago, I decided that if a student was going to lie to me about attending a funeral, if they were going to lie to me to get, I don't know, extra time on an assignment, I was going to stop asking for a death notice that appeared in the paper or oh, that was handed out. I, and, I, I won't ever ask for that again. No. And I, I think probably early in my career, I probably did because that's probably what I my did. colleagues advised me to do. So I, I did. Probably, I probably did it. And, but at some point I probably, I hope I decided it was morbid or it was too much of a hassle, quite honestly. And it's like, what if you're going to lie about that? Cause, Cause I think some faculty members, they just don't want to, they don't want to be one upped. They feel like that's a form of cheating when a student gets away okay. with that. Well, this is the thing, right? This idea of what's fair. What's right, fair? Right. What I, I want to be fair to every student. Why should, you know, and if a student has, trauma, yeah, of course, give them extra time. Give them a but chance fairness, to make right. it up. Fairness is relative, right? Because what right. someone can do in a certain situation, if something happens to them and disrupts their life in the middle of the semester, what they're capable of doing and right. giving might take so much more than someone who hasn't had that situation. So what's fair in that? What's right. fair? But is that the, fair to the student who's struggling? What's fair? I don't even, I question this all the time now. Yeah, and but so the, I think but the really... faculty member is so concerned with either their reputation or fairness that they go overboard and they make students produce evidence of the trauma, which you just mm -hmm. made the excellent point, is re-traumatizing. Re it's re-traumatizing to have to tell. If I have to tell five different people, you know, why I couldn't do something, that's traumatizing to me. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why... I, someone tells me my grandfather died and I can't be there that day in class because I have to attend the funeral. My response is, I'm very sorry for your loss. And I don't and take all the time you need. You may need more time and don't yeah, worry about it. We'll figure it out when you get back. That's right. And I'm so sorry that it happened to you. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? And we're doing and that all the support. time right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really, sometimes people's lives just stop. They just yeah. stop for, for lots of different reasons. And so, it's not for us to tell students what schedule to be on necessarily, right? Like, and that's why I really love now that post-COVID, I'm seeing so many more flexible kinds of deadlines and flexible assignments that just give students more, more wiggle room. I mean, what do we want them to what do we want them to do on a test? We want them to demonstrate their learning, right? We want them to be able to succeed because we want to, them to have an opportunity to show what they've learned right? Exams shouldn't be punishment. So let's be flexible in how we're going to let students do that. But just saying, okay, I see a lot more discussion on social media and in, in certainly in circles that I'm in about a flexible deadline, just not putting those dehumanizing kind of rigid practices that we all used to. Like I used to, I absolutely used to do those things. I think we were sort of taught that was part of our our culture at the time, academic culture. And, and again, I don't think it came from a bad place. I think it came from a good place, which was, well, people think that they're doing the student a favor by helping them get ready for the real world. But I'm telling you, the real world, I'm late on everything all the time, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> so we, what's the real world? People, we don't know what the, academics don't always know what the real world is or what it involves. So I quail at that. Well, I'm helping students prepare for the real world or the work world because work has a lot, work has a lot more flexibility than being a student, I got to take off six months. Right. I mean, I, not every workplace has that, but they should. Well, well, and there, also, we just don't have the same kind of mechanisms for students. Yeah. And there's a, obviously there's a bunch of factors at play. So, I mean, we, you and I live in an environment where we have deadlines where grades are due. So there, there are ultimately some deadlines that we must submit a grade. So there's going to be, I have found that there is almost no deadline that's inflexible. Well, almost there, none. There is you a deadline that I have to submit. Out. Otherwise there are financial aid implications. Okay. Well, I mean, but there's, 
for students. All right, I can't speak to every situation, but what I have found 2019 in my personal life and my work life, and certainly we all found this out in COVID, right? Because everything changed during COVID times, is that all of these deadlines that we think are just cannot be missed, a lot of them can be missed. But, but I mean, college semesters day, and what what I meant is college semesters and college quarters are set up on a timeline such that there are yeah, tends to be deadlines. Well, that's true Cut for students. That's very true. Yeah. So um, for, that's very true. But a lot of those deadlines are kind of they can be artificial. Right. Or right. We may, and, we may as faculty be operating under the assumption that these deadlines are inflexible when you know, maybe they're not. Oh, maybe I, can question I agree why with you. The, they're totally negotiable. Right. Much of the time. And so I, I just feel that we should be making decisions in the best interests of students and not in the best interests of deadlines and policies. And, I, I agree. Know. I also think that you and I are far enough in our career that we have the luxury that we can say that and we have the agency And I would bet that um, assistant professors and non-tenure track faculty and adjunct professors might not feel like they have that agency to be able to do that. So if you're listening, (laughs) what's that? I want them to know if they're listening, there may be a little more flexibility at times than you think there is. They probably have more power than they think. And they, yes, absolutely. Just find someone in, in your department that, and talk to them or your your unit or wherever. I just, I, I have really found over the years that a lot of things I was afraid of, deadlines I was afraid of missing, things like that. You miss them and there's always, there's there's some way to fix it. And I can't say every situation, but a lot of the time that's my experience. But that's just, again, compassion with ourselves when we're overwhelmed. I found that I really am drawn to talk to other people when they lose a loved one, just because I want them to know, like someone understands that they can talk to someone who's been through it. And I really try to reach out and just be there to listen. Listening is always something you can do for someone in grief. Listening is always something you can do because we just have a lot to process. And listening is always sometimes the best thing that you can do. But I try to reach out to people just to let them know. And I find that Although it does really make me feel better just to be able to to be there for them, it's really draining because it just brings back a lot of those feelings and emotions for myself. So I have to also have myself self, some self compassion, right? And then dial things back in other ways just to recognize that. And self compassion is not something that I've had much of at all. I've always just been given till I break kind of a person, and I I realize now that's just not a way to live. <laughs> That's not a way to live. Not for ourselves. And I don't think we should model that for our students either. I don't think we should expect that of our students. We should encourage them to have self-compassion for themselves as well and to think about how they're managing their resources and what expectations they have for themselves. Because what I've been observing over many years is students who are pushing to get a lot of college credit going into college, and then they get into college and they're pushing, and they exhaust themselves. They exhaust Mm -hmm. themselves. They exhaust their resources. And we've all seen this. We've all seen these mental health issues on college campuses, right? We should not be, we should not be actively encouraging that. We should be um, encouraging people to be compassionate, encourage students to be compassionate with themselves and give themselves. It's okay to have downtime. It's okay to have a day when you don't work. It's okay to take, have some fun at college, right? We don't expect you're just going to work all the time. Uh, We shouldn't. To have realistic expectations for, for academics in the context of life. I think. But compassion now to me means that I don't presume to understand that I know what someone is going through. And I don't presume to know how long it will take them or how much it will take them to do something. But that I know that they're suffering and they just need someone to say, I'm sorry. And that I thought is a terrible thing that's happened to you. And you don't have to worry about this right now. (laughs) No, you need to take care of yourself. Missy, as we've been talking about, the timeline is different for everybody. And that's part of your compassion operational definition. And I think it's a wonderful thing to offer. Are you, and maybe the answer is it never happens, but has the passing of your husband is there enough time or is it conceivable? Is it still immensely 
completely sad or is it now enough time? I'm not saying this very well. Can you look back now and think, have happy thoughts? Oh, uh, but you know what I'm saying? Is this still such a sad event that everything is sad or? or well, that or, was certainly how it was for a long time in the aftermath, but for sure there's lightness now. There's more lightness now. I, my, my functioning has certainly improved. I finally can read books for pleasure now. I actually found one of the one of the side effects for me cognitively was I just could not really engage in reading books, which I love reading books. And I thought after when I was taking some time off, I thought maybe I, I, I should try to read some books, right? Because that's something I love to do and it's very comforting. And I couldn't I couldn't read a book. I couldn't get more than a couple pages in. It was just too I couldn't even watch television. I couldn't watch a movie. I mean it was that dis- disabling. You really. couldn't and even reread a Harry Potter? No, Eric, I couldn't. At that. I mean, for, okay. for weeks. Would- and then finally, this just this past summer, so right almost a year and a half later, I was able to read a book for the first time. And then now it's much better. I mean, I was reading things for work, emails, yeah. things like that, but I couldn't, if you just lose yourself in a book, it's different cognitively. And yeah. I just hadn't been able to do that, but I, that's back. And, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot more lightness now. There's been some more, there's been a lot of other difficult things in the last almost two years, a lot of other really challenging things, but there's more lightness now. And I really love my job. I work with graduate students teaching. I work with graduate students preparing to teach for the first time. And I work with students taking intro psych. And that is just, that's so self-affirming for me. I really do think that helps so much. And although it was challenging for me to come right back and do my graduate teaching class and have to put it online, it was still so self-affirming. I think it was one of the things that kind of helped bring me back because it was so important to me to be able to deliver that class to those teachers, those new teachers, that I felt that really, that brought out a spark in me, I think, that I needed at the time. I needed to do something that meaningful to be able to regain some footing. And so it was hard, but that really helped me. And so the work that I love, my family, those things are really, yeah, they, yeah, they, they're lightness for me. So and life goes on, your life goes yeah. on. I'm no, I am not the same person I was before. I, in 2019, in almost every way, I'm very different now. I feel very different. I approach things very differently. I think differently. And I think just my goal is to just keep this compassionate mindset. And, and again, compassion doesn't mean that you're just throwing all of the, your expectations out the window. I mean, but it is recognizing that people are going to vary in terms of the extent that they can meet expectations. And it's not for us to judge that. And it's not for us to define that. And, and I think that just really kind of, kind of trying to, trying to integrate that into your approach to teaching is probably going to be chat would probably be very challenging for some people. To the extent you're comfortable, what are some of the ways that you've changed? Well, I just can't do as much as I used to do. I think I have a better appreciation for things in my life now than I did before. I think, gosh, I don't know. I don't really have to think about that. Those are the things that stand out to me the most. I definitely don't stress as much about things that I worried and stressed about before. There were certain sort of self-imposed goals and expectations and challenges for productivity because I I talk with this my therapist about this all the time, that I had just sort of been conditioned to feel that my work was my worth. And that I was only worth as much as the work that I was doing. And I needed to do more or better work to be satisfied with myself. And I really tried to deprogram myself of thinking that way, because that ultimately is a very damaging thing to think. And that really was difficult for me when I couldn't work, because there were just then feelings of worthlessness and feelings of despair that came in, came alongside that. And so it has taken me a lot of work, a lot of work to try to disentangle those things. And so I I really do feel like now I am more satisfied with lower levels of productivity, right? I mean, I'm still doing things I love and care about. I'm just also choosing not to push myself quite so far. But you can do great and amazing things at a high level of quality and just do fewer of them. 
Right. That's, I think that's what I'm doing. I'm prioritizing the things that are really important to me, like students and the graduate students. I just really want them to know that they're cared about. I mean, we can care about our students. We can care about our colleagues. I actually have many colleagues. I say, I love you all the time. And I do feel that closeness with them. And we can, we can express caring. I care about you. I hope you're all right. Are you taking care of yourself? Just asking how things are going. I think graduate school is a time when people are really stretched to their limits and just so much is expected of them in so many different ways. Just having some compassion and just recognizing that you are under a lot of pressure and stress. How can I, I make your life easier? What can I do? What can I do that might make your life easier? It's not a bad thing to ask. It's you were describing earlier how you kind of couldn't breathe when it all happened. And the best analogy that I was thinking about you of, of this event happening to you is just a major trauma. Oh yeah. It, it is a major trauma. It, it may be like an open heart surgery or a blunt force trauma or crash. gunshot wound. Abs it's the same. Yeah. It's just not a physical something that landed you in the wound, hospital. But the, right. But, a, but the psychological major mm -hmm. trauma. Absolutely. I, I consider it a major trauma. I do you, absolutely do. And I still have trauma responses. So. Yeah. Yeah. The things that you described to me, and I have no expertise in that area, but just as a lay person, the, the kinds of reactions that, that you shared with me, it, it makes it sound that way. Are, so, but, and this is another thing. What training or resources do we get to understand grief <laughs> as teachers, right? Right. Like, yeah. How, how can we better understand the impact of these events that are happening in students' lives. And I really would like to have more resources um, available to teachers to understand. I don't, I mean, I don't know where they will come from, but really to understand grief because grief is complicated. Grief is far reaching. Grief is physiological. It's cognitive. Grief is long lasting and kind of insidious because it affects you in ways that you don't really realize. And I feel that we would be all better served to understand it a little bit better, given that we know students experience grief in a lot of different ways. And the whole idea of trauma-informed teaching, I think I really need to explore more and understand more about the idea of trauma-informed teaching, because lots of, not just death, but lots of things can be traumatic, right? It's like students are experiencing lots of different traumas. And they're often experiencing it at a time in their lives when they're away from home for the first time right? They're a little more vulnerable. And so just being sensitive to that and not necessarily holding them to all the same standard or one's own expectations for what's reasonable, right? I just feel it's important for us to suspend some of those assumptions and make, in, make individual allowances in ways that are reasonable. Because what's fair, what we think is fair may not be fair, depending on what it takes someone who has experienced a trauma. Well, Missy, just listening to you makes me think we, we definitely need someone like you doing the work, something to do with grief coping, grief coping resources. That is, we're all going to have grief episodes in our life oh, of yeah. varying severities, but I don't think we get any systematic experience or practice or instruction Mm -mm. on dealing with it. We get training on how to drive a car and we get licensed to drive a car. We don't get training on how to deal with grief. No. And I, get... I was, a, I'm a social psychologist, right? So I don't have a background in clinical or counseling. So I've had to learn quite a bit. Yeah. But just even that little skill set of there's going to be loss. Trauma informed. And, 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 and trauma loss practice. of opportunities, loss of applying for a job and not getting it. Loss of getting a divorce, loss of a grandparent, loss of a beloved a child, pet, loss of a child, loss of a child, loss of opportunity. Again, varying, to, but and they're going to happen repetitively. And sometimes, if they happen too close in time, they're going to compound one another. And you might be able to deal with one loss, but when they pile up with three losses within a week, all of a sudden, 
then coping skills go out the door. So and the other thing is, again, like I'm not done with my grief. I'm still living no, with it and dealing I, with the aftermath. But, you know, many people that I work with, people that I work with, that's not, they don't, it's not on the, it's not on their minds anymore, right? Like it happened. It was a long time ago and I'm back and I'm doing things. They may not necessarily realize that I still struggle with that. And many colleagues haven't mentioned it to me. They don't want to bring it up. I think maybe they're afraid of, they're afraid of upsetting me or they don't know what to say, but yeah, some people have still have not even addressed that it happened. Of course there was the pandemic, right? And nobody saw each other for a long time. Yeah. I was wondering what would happen when we all finally started getting back to work. And it just, it's, for, for outsiders, it's over, right? Because someone died and then people moved on. For someone else, it's over, but it's never over for me. It will well, never be yeah. over. I think the phrase I've heard some people use about similar situations is that you don't ever get over it. You just get through it every day. You just learn how to navigate around it in your life. Right. And everyone is different. I don't want to speak for anyone else because everyone's grief and experience with grief is going to be very different. But, you know, I just think when things happen to people, we just have to acknowledge that maybe they might just need a little extra consideration, yeah. maybe just a little extra time. And, and or, you see, you know, I, I think with you or with anyone, really, I think some people just don't know what to say. Of course, of course. I don't think it's a lack of caring or lack or they've forgotten. It's just what do I say? And I, I think for, I think some people overthink it, which is, gosh, if I say something to her about her husband and it's been a while and I haven't seen her because of the pandemic, am I going to upset her? Well, it wouldn't upset me. And actually a couple of months ago, someone, when we first started being able to gather again, I was, yeah. and someone, I was just talking to people. It was really nice to see people. And one person just asked me directly and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about your husband are you doing okay? How's your son? I'm so sorry. That must, that just must have been, it just really directly addressed it. And I felt so relieved because sometimes <laughs> I was relieved. I mean, I know that happened in my life. I, right. I'm not, I can't forget it. I'm not going to ignore it. Right. I, yeah. I appreciate when people care enough to say something about that. Now, of course, everyone's different. Somebody may not, but ignoring it is particularly difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think some people will will just not know what to do. I don't think I don't think I texted you or I know I called you a couple months later, but I think I got permission from Jane Hallen to do that. I know, I know you did. <laughs> because I didn't want to be one of the ones that overwhelm you. You don't know what someone's mindset is and if you've talked about it twelve times already that day, do you really want to talk about right, it a thirteenth well, time? Thing. How why Okay. So I just, this is a really good example, right? I mean, I obviously only have my own personal experience here, but you know, again, that's something we all need to know more about, right? We need to know more about ways to handle these things, how to talk to people. I appreciate it personally when people acknowledge it because it is a thing that happened and it, it still is happening in my life. And so it's going to, I appreciate it if people haven't seen me in a while and they acknowledge it and they just say something about it other than just ignore it. Or if somebody tells you that they've lost someone, give, give that a minute. I am so sorry that right. happened to you. And don't just charge on you like it's nothing because it's not. Of course. And I just think sometimes as educators, you know, we just see things all the time and we just stop to think about the fact that this is an individual and this thing may, we have seen this thing maybe many times, but this is maybe the first time it's ever happened to the person in front of us. Missy, but before all of this, you would have characterized yourself as an extrovert, correct? <laughs> well, everybody else does. I'm asking you. I don't think I, I don't think I actually realized how much of an extrovert I was until the pandemic. When I couldn't be around people. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Because, because I think that might be part of it. I think for me, I don't know if I ever had to go through something as tragic as what you've gone through. Um, that, that expression of those kind, that kindness from people to me, all, it would be so kind coming from friends and family. It would be exhausting to me. Yeah, it, might be. it would be, it would get to the point with me. And maybe I shouldn't say this. I might have to edit this part out. It would be, oh, just stop. I just need, okay, I just need would, quiet time. I right. but would thank you, you so much for being kind to me. Now shut it. 
let me ask you a question. Would you appreciate someone asking you so that you had the chance to say, I'm a little overwhelmed by that? Actually, if I'm a little overwhelmed right now, you I don't, don't want to talk about that. how overwhelmed well, I am. Maybe we need some clinical people to weigh in on this because I, can, I don't have those skills. <laughs> but I but I think that's partly a personality preference that I think maybe individual extra- differences. They're going to be individual yeah, differences. An extrovert right? wants that juice from talking to people and they enjoy that fundamentally. I mean, I don't necessarily want to talk about it in detail, but, but, but I but, appreciate when it's acknowledged. In some right, way. right, right. And I, I'm not being critical. I'm just, yeah. it, it is exactly what you said, an individual difference. Whereas even when I told people about my pulmonary embolism, mm-hmm. I felt bad when I didn't reply back to emails because I sent out in a very lazy way, one mass email to people and people were so kind and flooding back with replies, but I felt really bad that either I didn't reply or it took me months to reply because- Mm, Sounds like a lack of (laughs) self-compassion. Well, no, my self-compassion was, I'm not replying right now. Right. Oh, exactly. I mean, why do you need to reply But I still felt guilty about not replying to my dear friends who took the time to and express who, their comfort and, and concern you, for me and who love you and just wanted you to know that. Right. But I felt like crap for not saying thank you, Missy. For and you your did email. that to yourself. It was, it was so you sweet three months ago. Right. You did that to yourself. Just like I've done that to myself Yeah. so many times and just been so hard on myself because I wasn't doing something that I thought I should be doing at the pace I should be doing it or at the level I should be doing it. And so so we're so self-critical of ourselves for all those things. And I know. So when are you going to develop the program where I can stop doing that? (laughs) I think Tara Brock already has it. I think we should just go watch her. (laughs) Tara Brock. Who is that? Tara Brock. Really, I highly recommend self-compassion, mindfulness, great stuff. Tara Brock. If you'll send me a link, I will put it in the show notes when this episode is released. Highly recommend. Very helpful to me. Mindfulness has been very helpful to me. Yoga has been very helpful. Anything that slows me down and just gives me a chance to just yard work actually is good because I don't really. I was going to say, how about that dog next to the pool? Yeah. Just being outside in nature, things that help me just stop thinking are very helpful. Just let me focus on one thing at a time. So, and I hate to admit it, but exercise does really help. I've always been sort of anti exercise, but I've been exercising now and I hate to admit it, but it, it actually is good. <laughs> admit whatever you want. It's all good. Yeah. So I still, I, I mean, I just, I don't want this to be about me. I wanted to share my story. I appreciate that. So that people could understand my experience so that, so that our colleagues who are educators can understand what our students might be going through. And that we can have more awareness and compassion, more flexibility, more kindness. It's never a bad, it's never a bad choice to be kind. And I have, I've always said in my job when I'm advising graduate teachers, it's always better to be kind than to be right. Have some like sense of like, the kind response is always the best response, in my opinion. And I feel that even more strongly now. Missy, the psych sessions podcast interviews do tend to be about the people being interviewed. So it's okay for this to be about you. I wanted to share it in service of the message. Of course you did. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. Of course you you didn't want it to be about you. Of course. And the platform. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy. I'm not, I mean, I'm happy to support people's understanding of what it means to go through grief or trauma or the, some kind of major disruption in your life. Because I just hope that maybe some of you can keep it in mind when you encounter students that are having events in their lives. And maybe it will just encourage you to be just a little more kind or a little more flexible or give them a little more grace than maybe you would have before. And that, that was my motive. And I appreciate of course. you, Eric, giving me the chance to say it. Of course. Only you would find a way to make this a teachable moment. <laughs> I, I got to ask you any anything on the horizon for the future. Any anything you want to share? And by the way, this isn't a loaded question. Like I know what you're going to say because I don't. Yeah, no, uh, I'm just any, happy any, to be back. I'm happy to be back at the job that I love. 
so much. There's a long time I didn't know if I could come back and function. I'm really happy to be able to be doing the things that I love and care about. I'm I'm really I've transitioned from being like a two two income household to a single person living. I I think I'm I'm pretty proud of those accomplishments too. So I'm just trying to give myself grace and just take one day as it comes and and just have more gratitude, more self-compassion feel a little less pressure to push myself so hard and just, again, just kind of be as compassionate and understanding as I can about what people may be going through or what they might need and suspending some of my expectations about what they should or shouldn't be doing. Just giving more grace. There can never be enough grace. Yeah. More grace and more kindness, even without the dramatic and traumatic loss that you've encountered is the Good lesson for everyone during a pandemic. And right, which still I, hope, I hope we continue that post pandemic. Right. And just because we're going back to more familiar ways of teaching, more familiar ways, maybe there's slightly less disruption um, than there has been. I, I really hope that we don't lose some of the, the flexibility, the understanding the just a different view of what students may need because even though the pandemic isn't necessarily going to be as much of a need other ne- there's still other needs are still going to be there and so uh, we shouldn't just go back to ignoring that students need <laughs> help and support and resources and flexibility i think it opened our eyes collectively to maybe ways that we weren't doing that previously and ways that we can think about that more in the future. I think that's a yes and. So first off, I don't think we're the pandemic's over. And I think the Delta variant is showing us that we may have to be flexible and pivot again. And I also think, and this one scares me maybe more than the grand pivot, is that individual pivots mm-hmm. where a student comes along and says, I I need to take this co- this face-to-face course for the next four weeks online. And I will tell you that- Oh, I'm already seeing that. I'm already seeing those kinds. We're trying to figure that, those things out now. <laughs> and that's a difficult thing for most instructors, myself included, to be able to do. Because if I'm teaching 83 students in my face-to-face capstone class, it's really difficult for me to then also start offering that same class with the same level of quality to and four students I on agree. Zoom. I agree. And I would yeah. say that- a compassionate response doesn't necessarily have to be a response that sacrifices your own well-being. Right, right. Yeah. But at the same time, how do we give that compassion to those students who tell us, I, I got to be away or I got to be out? And so it's finding so that gotta, balance. I think that's going to be the, the next challenge coming that we have to navigate. Oh, it's here. It's on my campus. Yeah. Yeah, so it's here. There's more we need to still think about, but... Yeah, right. I'm not. I'm. I certainly know that all of this still needs to be negotiated. But. Yeah, but I think your framework of kindness and compassion—that's the fundamental core principle. And if we operate from that, mm-hmm. and I think part of that's going to be utilizing technology. And I even think it's okay to lower the bar on learning outcomes. I agree. Maybe not on the learning outcomes themselves, but on some of the other stuff that we put in there around the learning outcomes. Well, prioritize the learning outcomes. Well, do we really think that a multiple choice test tells us what we think it tells us? Well, I know how you feel about that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, what do we really need a student to know at the end of research methods or statistics or intro psych or social psych or and for, much, for many of us we just base that on our own ex- on our own beliefs and expectations right so i do i agree i think sometimes we can say do we really need to have these expectations what good is it yeah. and expectations are increasing all the time everywhere yeah. right everything just gets more and more and so maybe it's okay if we dial some things back i mean i will just say that i think that was a bit of a benefit of the pandemic that we all we, we, we there were things that we couldn't do And maybe we realized that I don't really need to be doing all those things. (laughs) Maybe I'm a little better off if I don't. And so in some ways, it hopefully can be a bit of a wake up call. And we don't necessarily, as we transition back to a post-ish pandemic world, we don't need to transition back to everything that was going on before. Certainly, we can think more carefully and critically and um, thoughtfully, compassionately, holistically, take more time to make those kinds of decisions. 
there there were tragic epic losses during the pandemic, but there were also a handful of silver linings that we unexpectedly experienced, and we should pay attention to those. Missy, thank you so much for sharing your time, sharing your story, sharing your own compassion. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to have this opportunity first to just see you and talk to you. It's good to see you and talk to you. And just also to just to find a way to, to share that message. So thank you. Mm-hmm.